Hello everyone, today we are returning to thermodynamics in order to address the first law, also known as the law of conservation of energy. We can formulate the first law both in terms of a closed system and in an isolated system, and that is why it is important to understand which system we are describing. The first law of thermodynamics simply states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So let's introduce the first law in a closed system using a thought experiment. Imagine a cavity on Earth which experiences gravity and is filled with helium atoms. The sides and upper portion of the cavity are comprised of adiabatic walls. You recall from the video on the zeroth law that adiabatic walls do not allow the transfer of energy as heat or light. The top portion of this particular adiabatic wall is movable, creating a piston. This allows work to cross the adiabatic wall. The floor of our cavity is a diathermal wall which can conduct heat between our system and its surroundings. For now, our adiabatic wall will completely surround our system, including the diathermal wall. We can place an iron cube on top of this system, but first, let's imagine it at various elevations above the Earth. As the cube is brought to higher elevations, its potential energy increases Potential energy in joules is equal to the acceleration due to gravity of the Earth, the lowercase g, times the cube's mass, m, times the height, h, above the Earth. The higher we bring up the iron cube, the greater its potential energy. If the cube fell, the potential energy becomes energy of motion, or kinetic energy, which is equal to one half times the mass of the iron cube, times its velocity squared. If we threw the cube upwards, kinetic energy will be converted entirely to potential energy, then back to kinetic energy as it falls to the ground. We can see that potential energy and kinetic energy are interchangeable. We can now return our cube to the top of the piston. When we do so, we would observe at equilibrium that the downward force on the piston would be met by an equal upward force associated with the gas pressure of the helium atoms. In this example, the iron cube is not part of the system, it is part of the surroundings. The internal energy of the system can be characterized by the kinetic energy of the gas atoms, ignoring any energy in the walls. When thermal equilibrium is reached, a unique temperature will exist because of the zeroth law. The average velocity of the atoms will become constant, since it is related to the square root of the temperature. The gas atoms in the system define what is known as the internal energy of the system, written as U. If the system experiences a change, then its internal energy will change. By subtracting the initial internal energy U sub I from the final internal energy U sub F, we know how much change occurred. Mathematically, change is written as the Greek letter delta. Therefore, delta U represents a change in internal energy. Let's put the first law into mathematical form for our closed system. Heat Q and work W are central to change in internal energy. Importantly, heat can be used to do work. When work is performed on a system, the efficiency is measured relative to the energy lost as heat. We will discuss this when we address the second law. Work is defined as force through a distance. Energy can enter or leave our system in the form of work through the movable adiabatic piston wall. If we move the piston up, we would do work against the downward force from the iron cube. Therefore, if the piston is caused to move up, the system has done work. If the piston moves down, the iron cube would be acting against the upward force of the helium atoms in the cavity, and work would have been done on the system, increasing its gas pressure. Energy is the capacity to do work. This is a central idea in thermodynamics because we are now able to define energy as a fundamental concept. When a person says, I can't work today, I have no energy, they are actually properly stating the relationship between work and energy. Without energy, you can't do work by definition in thermodynamics. On the other hand, if you have a lot of energy, then you have the capacity to do work. Now let's discuss heat. Heat is the amount of energy which can be transferred as a result of a difference in temperature. Heat uses random motion of atoms to transfer the energy. So the transfer of heat energy requires different temperatures, such as between an object and its surroundings. In our video on the zeroth law, we utilize heat transfer to reach thermal equilibrium and thereby help define temperature. We could also have reached thermal equilibrium by transferring energy as work. 
Work and heat are related in the context of energy transfer and temperature. Now let's modify our illustration by placing a heat source below our cavity, removing the lower adiabatic wall, and locking the piston into place. Since the bottom of our cavity is diathermic, heat can be transferred into our system, changing its internal energy. The velocity of the atoms and the temperature will rise, and so will the pressure. The ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, shows that at constant volume, if T increases, then P must also increase, and vice versa. Since the volume in this case is constant, the change is termed as either isovolumic, isochoric, or isometric. Conversely, we could have done the experiment with our piston unlocked. In that case, it could move such that the pressure stayed constant. An isobaric change would be taking place. The volume would increase with temperature when the piston moves up, and it does some work. This leads to a new understanding of work. Work is the transfer of energy using the uniform motion of atoms. We can finally present a mathematical form of the first law of thermodynamics. The first law states that for a closed system, the change in internal energy, delta U, will be equal to the change in heat, Q, added to the system, plus the change in work, W, done on the system. In this equation, all energy transferred into the system makes a positive contribution to the internal energy. It is also possible that work is done by the system if the piston raises the iron cube. In that case, we can write that the change in internal energy will be equal to the heat Q of the system minus the work done by the system W. This is what happens in an isothermal process. Heat enters the system equal to the work performed, and no change in internal energy occurs. The volume increases and the pressure decreases such that the temperature stays constant. In these examples, if the heat source was to be replaced by a heat sink instead, and we locked our piston into place such that no work occurred, then energy could leave our system as heat through the diathermal wall. Q would be negative, the temperature would drop, and so would the internal energy of the system. By using a closed system, we have shown a relationship between energy, heat, and work, and formulated a mathematical expression for the first law of thermodynamics. The statement of the first law is even easier in an isolated system, since no heat or work can be transferred for such a system from the surroundings. Since the first law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, an isolated system simply has a constant internal energy. Because of this, we know that perpetual motion machines of the first kind do not exist. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, and if a perpetual motion machine of the first kind existed, that would be a violation of the first law. Another important concept in thermodynamics is called path independence. When we change the internal energy of a closed system, it does not matter how the change was made. It could be done through many small steps, or in a single step, using either the transfer of heat or through work. In all cases, the system will have no memory of how the change in internal energy has occurred. In addition, thermodynamic processes are often labeled as reversible or irreversible. A reversible process is one where a quasi-static transformation occurs, and it does so so slowly that the system remains close to equilibrium. If we could hypothetically remove a few atoms from the iron cube, the piston would move up, add a few atoms, and it would move down. In that case, the change could be viewed as reversible. The study of thermodynamics usually involves a full course in college, which can be followed by more classes in graduate school. But for today, we learned the principles behind the first law. These include the conservation of energy, its relation to work and heat, and how the law can be expressed for a closed system and for an isolated system. This sets us on the path to the second law. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. In addition, subscribe if you want to journey with me through space here at Sky Scholar. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.